sitting at home watching the live stream and wanting to be at church so bad and realizing you can't be there and realizing how miserable it felt to not be there. And it made me even sadder to think that so many of our shut-ins face that week after week. So if you think of our shut-ins during the week, call them, encourage them, shoot them a message, because they don't get to experience what we so often take for granted here. Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse number 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the, love, whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to stand again in your pulpit. I thank you for your hand upon me, the the healing that I've felt even thus far, Lord, I pray that you'll be with me this evening, be with my voice. Lord, I pray that you'll help us uh, as we dive in and study this portion of the book of Proverbs, which has been so richly rewarding thus far, Lord. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. We've returned this evening um, to our study in the book of Proverbs. We we seen last week a very familiar passage to us and said that there was five key principles in the first ten verses of chapter three to having a satisfied life. Uh, the two verses there in the middle of that, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And I guess that really you could summarize the first 10 verses in saying this statement that trusting in your own understanding is spiritual suicide. And it'll wreck your life leaning upon yourself. But even more, Solomon returns here and puts before us in verses 11 through 18 another key thought. But it's not the keys to having a satisfied life, but this is something in life that we should not despise. Now, when we think about the things in life in which we should not despise, I guarantee this is not the thought that initially comes to mind. When we read here, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. If we're honest with ourselves, no one likes to be corrected no one likes to be chastened. But if we're honest with ourselves, we need the chastening and the correcting hand of the Lord as much as we need our daily bread from the Lord. Though we are children of God, the reality is that we're also children of Adam. We still have his will. We still have his pride. We're still prone to wonder. We still struggle believing in our own independence. And because of this, our lives are in constant need of teaching and correction. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. It's interesting that Solomon would have to even tell his son to despise not the correction of the Lord. But what is really presented to here to us is 
the pride of the human heart, the arrogance of our own emotions, that we believe that we could make it through this life and never need to be corrected, to make it through this life and never need to be realigned. Growing up, I had a friend who it was a weekly conversation that we would have after his parents would correct him. I'd see him and he'd say, I almost ran away last night. I almost ran away. Four or five years, that's what he always said. He was like a mockingbird. Good news, he never ran away. Well, you know what? In all of those years that he kept saying that I, I almost ran away, it brought to my mind this evening is that his eyes was that the problem, his focus was that his problem was that he was receiving correction. He despised the correction. The correction was the problem. He hated the chastening. The chastening was the problem. And this is the story of our nature. And this is Solomon's warning to his son. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. The reality is that in the same way that my friend was bitter with his parents for correcting him and chastening him, that we in the same way can have the same attitude with the Lord. Well, if you're going to treat me like this, then I'm not going to do that. If this is the way you think you're, you can just treat me, then how could I ever be faithful to you? You're going to be faithful to me, and then I'll be faithful to you. Solomon says to his son, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, and don't be weary of his correction. In the first 10 verses, we said when we looked at that last week that the, the, it was the um, odd verses was the command was given. In the even verses, the promises were given if you were to heed those commands. But here in our text, uh, we see something a little different this evening. He, he said, Solomon says, I want you to understand if you're experiencing the chastening hand of the Lord in your life, if you experience the correcting hand of the Lord in your life, there is only one reason why. He says in verse 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Even as a father, the son in whom he Delighted. There it is. The only reason that we experience correction or chastening from God is simply because He loves us. It's a strange thing to think that we found favor and care and concern in our lives from the Lord, and it is made manifest in our lives through Him correcting and chastening us. But when you apply it to the parental level in our own lives, we don't run around disciplining other people's children because we have not been given the responsibility for other people's children. We discipline our own because they belong to us. And here he says, Solomon says to him, son, don't you despise the correcting hand of the Lord. He's doing it simply because he is your heavenly father and he loves you. If we get to despising the Lord over the things we experience in our lives, we are no different than my childhood friend who says that he will run away at the onset of punishment. It is foolishness, it is foolishness to even have such a thought, really, but it was his parents that were steering him back. We, we have to know this and we remind ourselves of this. When we face the corrective hand of God, it is not that God is in some uncontrolled way taking out his anger upon us. It is that God in a loving way is guiding us to a correct path. When I was younger and my mom used to punish me, uh, she says I've been bringing it up too much here lately. 
I said, you know, once you get to thinking about it, you can't let go. It kind of grips you for a couple of weeks. But we'll hopefully we'll be done with it tonight. But when I was younger and my mom used to punish me, I used to roll my eyes because she used to tell me before she'd pat me, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And I would be thinking, well, then let's swap, you know. I didn't really understand what that meant until I became older and I was a parent. And the reality was it is heart-wrenching to discipline your child. It is heart-wrenching to have to do that. But I also recognize as a parent that when I discipline my child, it is not only an act in the moment, it is actually an investment into your child's life. The reason is that an investment into your child's life is because if you teach your child that this is wrong, the desire is that they won't do this again in the future and that they won't continue to replicate this and build upon this lifestyle that will ultimately bring them great harm in their life. And before long in my own personal life, I learned that those times of corrections, those times of spankings was really just evidence that my mother loved me and wanted me on the right path. And so it is for us in the life as believers, your sufferings are not evidence against you. Your sufferings are not evidence against God, but it's just simple evidence that the Lord loves you and cares for you. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Even as a father, the son in whom he delighted. So what do we see here? Is, is like a painter painting a painting, like a sculptor sculpting an image, like a, a potter making a vessel. I guess you could re reference... Um, Romans 8 and verse 29, for who, to form, to, uh, of course, for, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of the Son. In, in each of these moments of correction, in each of these moments of chastening, God is ultimately working in our lives. What is the ultimate goal? to conform us to the image of his son. This is, a, this is a time of investment in our lives when we experience it is love. Now, yes, it's painful. Correction is painful. Correction is painful when we read it. I don't know if you've ever been there. You've been studying in the word of God and you read it and you read something and this is something that you're guilty of. It hurts and you want to make it right. But even then, this is times of correction. Ultimately, the Spirit is working within us through the Word to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Our Father lovingly, and our Father is, our loving Father is ultimately working in our lives to conform us to the image of the Son. And when we see, when we see what's happening there, this is really a, a connecting point between Verses 12 and the next four verses. If you miss what's happening in verse 11 and 12, the next four verses really doesn't make much sense to me. But when you understand that God is using his word, and when God is using his word to conform us to the image of his son, and that correcting and chast uh, this chastisement, this chastening that we feel that comes through his word, when we really see that, we begin to love it. And we begin to see how precious God's word is to us. And when we see how precious it is to us, we're not willing to exchange it for nothing. So Solomon here is connecting two thoughts to his son's mind. Son, if you really 
Don't despise the chastening hand of the Lord. If you don't despise this correcting of the Lord and you understand that the Lord loves you and that he's just trying to form, conform you to the image of his son, then guess what? Ultimately, he's trying to raise a son up who loves the word. But look what he says here uh, in the next verse. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more, the she is wisdom. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. The length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths our peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. He's saying, son, <laughs> when you really see what the Lord does is doing in your life, you will try to do everything you can to lay hold of wisdom. And when you lay hold of wisdom, when you do everything to get a hold of it, wisdom in your life. You are going to be a, a happy person. Actually, it says, happy is the man that findeth wisdom. That findeth wisdom. There is a story of a young couple told, and the couple's name was Bill and Emily. The soon-to-be husband came up with the witty idea about how to propose to his wife. She was some kind of crossword puzzle guru. So he decided to contact the New York Times and to see if he could work out a way for him to insert his proposal to his wife inside of the crossword puzzle. So the New York Times agreed, and on the date that they had set forth, him and his wife went to their favorite restaurant for breakfast, and as they were there for breakfast, he began to read the sports page, and she began to read the crossword puzzle. As the time was going on, soon his wife, or his soon-to-be wife, would say, Bill, Bill, you're never going to believe this. My name is in this crossword puzzle. Soon she would say, Bill, Bill. Your name is in this crossword puzzle. And then she began to become really frantic when she uncovered the words modest proposal followed by, will you marry me? Emily looked at Bill in astonishment and said, yes. You know, the Bible at times may seem like a crossword puzzle to us at times. We struggle through it, hoping to find wisdom for life's questions. And Solomon understood the struggle of obtaining wisdom from the word of God. But he also understood that the search was well worth it. Sometimes when you're uncovering things in the word of God, we take an approach that we wanted to jump out and just grab a hold of us. Well, I opened it up to this page. Lord, you should have had me open it up to this page, and I read this verse, and I had my eyes closed when I pointed to it, and you just didn't give me the answer that I was looking for. Solomon says here that happy is the person who findeth wisdom. If you find wisdom, it means you were seeking it. And seeking is an endeavor. It's not a statement in one second in your life. You know what? I don't know about you, but seeking things at times is hard work. I find a hard enough time going to Home Depot and finding the thing that I need on the shelf, and they told me what island bay it was in. It's hard at times to seek wisdom. Nevertheless, the word of God has been given to us with all the answers. Blessed is the man. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. Now, uh, you know, when we envision a happy life, 
oftentimes we allow our minds to envision the portrait on the wall that has a guy sitting there next to the beach with his feet kicked up, relaxing in the shade on a beautiful day. You know, we say, oh, that's happiness. Uh, we envision happiness as the person who uh, no longer has to work, that they've become, you know, so successful that their money makes money. Or we view happiness as possessions, you know, and so on and so forth. But here he says, happiness is a man. Blessed is the man that findeth wisdom. This word findeth is the same word that's used in Proverbs 18.22 when it says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. It's not that verse 18.22 doesn't just say that you found a woman. It's that you found a wife and that you have acquired a wife. It helps us to understand our text because when we use the word wisdom here, that's what findeth means. It means you've acquired something. We've acquired wisdom. But to kind of give you a better understanding of the use of the word wisdom here, when he says happy is the man that findeth wisdom, the word wisdom here means skillfulness. It is the same word that's used when the men who were called to build the temple or to build the tabernacle, the, those people who were skillful in the working of metal, they were skillful in the working of gold, they were skillful when it came to the carpentry, they were skillful when they built and sewed the, the linens together. Together, that's the That word that speaks of their skills is the same word that's being used here for wisdom. So Solomon is telling his son is, blessed is the man who has been blessed by the Lord. Happy is the man who's been blessed by the Lord and given the ability to lead a godly life, a good life. Happy is the man who's been given the skills by the Lord to make the right decisions. Happy is the man who's able to face temptation and to trust God's word that this is the right way and that is the wrong way. Happy is a person who has built a life of reliance upon the Lord. That person will be truly blessed. That is a person who's found to be happy when their ultimate confidence is in the Lord, who has the ability to live life with mass, maxim, maximum success and minimum failure. Wisdom is choosing the right course of action for the desired results. The ultim, ultimately, I read this to say that happy is the person who's found faith in Jesus. Happy is the person who sought him for understanding because understand today that wisdom is not an object wisdom is the person Jesus Christ and that is where wisdom is found today there are so many people who are miserable uh, trying religion or trying this practice or that practice trying to experience whatever they can in this life to experience happiness and have not yet found it because they have failed to Look to Jesus. There is a general call to all humanity to seek the Lord while he may be found, to come and taste the Lord and see how sweet he is. To The Bible says even in Revelation in that final invitation that the Spirit and the Bride says, Come and let him that heareth come and let him that a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And for the person who finds that water of life, happiness is in store. But look at the value of this wisdom. For the merchandise, verse 14, of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things 
that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. What a statement. It is to say that there is nothing in this world, no diamonds, no rubies, no physical possessions that could ever be compared to the gem that we have in God's Word, to the wisdom that rests in these 66 books. There is no comparison at all. Wisdom is better than money. It's better than stuff. You know why? Because wisdom cannot be destroyed. It doesn't matter how beautiful your car is. Guess what? Before long, it's going to be broke down. It's going to be raggedy. You'll be wondering why you're still making car payments, how they ever convinced you to finance this for 12 years, and so on and so forth. That's just how it goes, but not wisdom. Wisdom never gets old. Wisdom never fades away. Uh, Matthew tells us about this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through your steel, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through in steel. I hope you can understand here that wisdom puts you in relationship with the Lord. You could be rich this evening. Rich. You could have the biggest table in all the world. You could have all the money to buy all the food you want to fill that entire table. But understand, money doesn't give you brothers and sisters to put around that table. Does it? No. Wisdom does. Seeking the Lord does. You could... Have all the money you could ever imagine to buy a big house. But it doesn't make it a home. The proverb says wisdom makes it a home. Money can buy a woman jewelry, but it cannot buy her real love. Throughout this entire study in the book of Proverbs, you will see Wisdom is better because it gives us physical blessings. It gives us spiritual blessings. And because it gives us relational blessings. It, it teaches us here what we've even seen from Proverbs chapter 1 to Proverbs chapter 3 that wisdom creates happy homes. Wisdom creates loving marriages. Wisdom produces, as we see here before us, treasures that cannot be bought in the marketplace. That's what wisdom produces. Look at what else he says. She is more precious than rubies. And all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. The value of the things that we learn in God's word do not even compare to this material possession. The length of days and is in her right hand and in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is, a light, she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. I guess you could summarize these next portions of these verses that we've covered in this portion of Proverbs as wisdom's value. But I guess the question is, how do we apply this? Is how do you value wisdom? Now, uh, we could say whatever we want here today, but this is a personal poll. How you value wisdom is made evident in your personal life by how you seek wisdom. If you value it, you will seek it. If you do not value it, you will not seek it. The more important something it is, the closer it is to you. When we value the word of God, 
we will lovingly go after. But you know why we don't like it? Because of what verse 11 and 12 says. Because we read God's word and it corrects us. And instead of throwing our arms around a loving Lord and saying, thank you for putting me back on the right path this morning, we're bitter. And say, every time I read that book, I mean, I, I love the Lord. I'm thankful that he sent his son to die on the cross for me. But every time I read it, I mean, it's like, I mean, if I followed everything in that book, I'd be a stick in the mud. I mean, that's how people often approach this. And because of that, they devalue the word of God because they value themselves over the word of God. So Solomon says, son, first thing you got to understand is correction is important for you to stay on the path that you need to be on. The second thing you need to understand is correction isn't from a heart of anger. It's from a heart of love. If he didn't correct you, it means he didn't love you at all. But he corrects you because he loves you. Now, son, because now that you understand that I, that I love you and that the Lord loves you, I need you to understand this precious book that he's left for us, that he's given us. Now, I understand they didn't have the completed 66 books, but his Solomon was trying to teach his son the value of God's word. And he says, this right here, wisdom, where you get wisdom, it's more precious than anything here. I could just imagine Solomon, the richest man in all the world, who his garden was the seventh wonder of the world. I could just imagine his son all of the thousands and thousands of horses he owned and armies that he owned and all of these things. I could imagine Solomon walking out to the uh, courtyard of his home and saying, my son, what we have here in God's word is worth more than anything you see out here. It's worth more than anything. You know that, son? So really for all of us, from our heavenly father to us today, he says to each and every one of us, when you leave here, the car you drive in, the home you go to, your jewelry box, whatever it is that you find the joy and happiness in. He says, son, do you realize what's contained in this book is more valuable, it's more precious than anything you've seen this evening. And if it's that precious, we should go feast our eyes upon it. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this evening, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the continual unveiling of your word to us, Lord. And we pray for the request that was lifted up before the services, Lord. <coughs> we give thanks to you for all that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen.